Okay, so this week we are continuing our series on the relationships in the kingdom of God. And we're, we're on to week three of talking about LGBTIQ+. So in a word, it's, it's about same-sex relationships. And this is part three of the three, third week of this message. And some of you may have noticed I haven't actually put those messages online yet. And I'm going to do that after the third message. I felt like it was important that when I posted these online that, that there's, there's the first three weeks. So you get, you, get, uh, an, you get not just a part view, but you get a much fuller picture. And then, of course, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to be talking about um, transgender. So that, that's, that's T. That's the T in the LBGTIQ+. And so this week, I'm continuing on specifically on, on um, gay and lesbian and bisexual part of that. And you know what? I, <laughs> I felt like this would be the last week, but I don't think it is. It's just been an amazing journey for me in, in researching and preparing for these messages because I've learnt so much. And, and as I do that, I feel like the Lord's speaking to me and, and, and narrowing certain a focus in certain areas. And so, uh, you know, I've got to be led by the Lord in these and, and, and I feel like there's another week. So this is not the last week, although I will post the first three weeks up after this Sunday. But we're talking about gay Christians and the church. And uh, last week, where we ended was with the story of this guy, David Bennett. And he, sh- he shared via video his, his story as a gay Christian and how he came to faith. Uh, and today, to start off, and there's gonna be, I'm going to be showing a bit of video this morning, and I think that's really, really important. We're going to be hearing from a guy called Wesley and Wesley's story. And what I, I feel like that, you know, last week we focused on the scriptures in exegeting, the, uh, looking at the interpretation of those texts specifically on this area. And I, and, and I feel like I could do that. But when we start to talk about people's story of being gay and a Christian, I, c- I don't have any authority on that. And so I felt like this week, mainly, I wanted us to hear from others. And so now that's what we're going to do. We're going to hear from a guy called Wesley. My name is Wesley Hill, and I am an assistant professor of New Testament studies at Trinity School for Ministry in Ambridge, Pennsylvania. I've been uh, teaching New Testament here for about three years. I finished a PhD in New Testament studies at Durham University in the UK. Before that, I did a master's degree there in theology and religion. And for my undergraduate degree, I I went to Wheaton College where I studied biblical languages. I came to the study of these biblical passages about homosexuality and biblical sexuality more broadly as someone who myself uh, realized during puberty that I was attracted to the same sex. Um, this was not, at first, a very welcome realization for me. I, I was raised in an evangelical Christian church, um, in a Christian family, and the, 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 the moral norms that I heard were that, you know, gay sex was, was out of bounds, it was off limits, and gay people were somehow, you know, twisted and, and perverted. And, you know, it wasn't that my parents or my church went around saying that all the time, but that was just kind of in the air. That was the air I breathed. That was the atmosphere that I grew up in. And so I really did not want to be gay. I, that was not what I would have been looking for. And I realized when I was 13, 14, 15 years old that this was the pattern of my sexual attractions. I was pretty much exclusively attracted to the same sex. And so it became a real question for me of how do I grapple with my Christian faith? How do I, how do I read the Bible? Um, what, what view of these texts do I come from that won't just condemn me to live with total shame and total guilt? And so I really came to, to Scripture with, with, with those questions really urgent in my mind. 
I think like a lot of gay young people, I was really confused about what to believe. I, I knew that I was loved by my church growing up, loved by my family, and so there was an implicit trust in what I'd been told. There was the sense that I, I've not been misled, this must be what the Bible teaches. But as I grew older and as I encountered other kinds of Christians, more progressive Christians, I encountered other ways of reading the Bible. You know, talking about these texts as focused on temple prostitution or or exploitative same-sex relationships, and they're not talking about monogamous, faithful, gay unions of today. And so I think like a lot of people of my generation, I come at the scriptural issues in an atmosphere where Christians are disagreeing with each other about how to read these. And it, it was a question for me about, you know, do I, do I go with a more liberal, progressive reading? Do I go with a more conservative reading? You know, what's right? And I think I, I was grappling with, with the biblical interpretation questions very much in light of that, very much recognizing that the church right now is divided on this. Uh, we, 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 are, we are not of one mind as, as Christ's body on earth. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church it has a very robust and serious tradition of, of teaching uh, a kind of a view of, of male-female complementarity, male-female sexuality ordered to procreation. Homosexuality is a missing of the mark of that. That would be perhaps on one end of the spectrum. Then you would have you know, more liberal Protestant groups that would say, no, that's just a, that's a complete you know, misreading of the biblical evidence. And actually the Bible is, is diverse, it's contradictory, and there's ample room to kind of rethink the traditional Christian picture of sexual morality. And so the challenge for me as a, as a young Christian, a young gay Christian, was where do I locate myself in this? How do, I, how do I come to understand the mind of Christ on this issue of homosexuality? I think one of the ways I ended up embracing the traditional Christian picture of, of biblical sexuality is through what Peter Berger and other sociologists have called a plausibility structure. Um, a plausibility structure is, is, a, is a way of thinking about why certain beliefs make sense to people. And I think when you, when you look at my life, I mean, one of the ways that I came to believe this traditional Christian view of things was because I was surrounded by a structure of churches and, and Christians who allowed me the space to wrestle honestly before God with these questions and who loved me in the midst of my confusion. I talk in my, my book, Washed and Waiting, about a lot of late nights spent drinking coffee with my Christian friends, wrestling with these things, crying over these things, praying about these things. And I think it was that, that faithful love from my fellow Christians, that kind of faithful presence of my fellow Christians that gave me the, the plausibility structure that allowed this biblical picture of sexuality to begin to make some sense to me. I think if I had encountered only Christians who were, who were hateful or who were you know, uh, consigning me to outer darkness, so to speak, probably the traditional picture wouldn't have seemed as, as trustworthy or as likely to be true because it wouldn't have been backed up with the, the actual lived compassion of, of Christians around me. What, what I th found really interesting about uh, Wesley's story was it, it's, in some ways it's very different to David Bennett's. So you, you, you've got here um, Wesley who, who grew up as a Christian. He, he's, an, he's in the Anglican stream of Christianity uh, he, he wrestled with the scriptures over it. And, and compared to David, who was, didn't grow up in a Christian home, he had a very dramatic, charismatic experience with God, the love of God. And, uh, you know, from being a, a, a you know, radical, uh, anti-Christian, gay activist um, past... So, and yet he, he had this profound experience with the love of God, which changed everything. Um, so I found, you know, both these guys' story really, really fascinating, and, uh, but very different. But, you know, here's, here's the, the conclusion that they both come to, which I, which I talked about last week, was that if we conclude that, the traditional view uh, that same-sex sexual behaviour is, is not God's ideal for human expression. Uh, sorry, the traditional view is God's ideal, 
that is same-sex sexual behaviour is outside of how God sees sexual expression in humanity, there's some questions you need to ask. Here's a couple of them. Is same-sex orientation something to be healed of or changed from? So, so, so these two guys self-identify as gay. They're gay. But they also want to follow Jesus. So the question that arises in my mind, and I think a lot of Christians, is if, if, that's, if they're gay and that's not God's ideal, can they be healed or can they be changed from that? Here's another question. Um, is there a place in church for those who identify as same-sex attra attracted? Is there a place in church for those who would call themselves gay Christians so that they're, same, they're still same-sex attracted? You know what? I very rarely hear anyone in church talking about this. I think oftentimes it's just too hard and we just avoid the conversation. So let me just share a little bit more of, uh, from Wesley. One of the points that people often make about the Bible, and I think it's a good point to make, I think it's true, is that the Bible doesn't operate with our modern understanding of sexual orientation. Um, the Bible focuses on what we might call sex acts. It focuses on sexual behavior. When Paul in Romans 1 diagnoses humanity as fallen, he, and he talks about women giving up natural intercourse, men giving up natural intercourse for unnatural, he's, he's talking about the act of coupling, the act of intercourse. And he's not, he's not saying if you feel yourself tempted in a certain way, if you feel yourself drawn in a certain way to others, that's sin. I, I, think he's, I think he's doing something more concrete than that. He's saying, this is porneia, this is sexual immorality, don't, don't go this way, because if you're a baptized Christian, that's part of your old fallen Gentile life that, that God rescued you out of. And so there are a lot of Christians today who would say, you know, I want to follow Christ, and I want to follow the, 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 the sexual norms that I see in the pages of the, of the New Testament, but I know that from adolescence, from puberty, I have been powerfully drawn, romantically drawn, to the same sex. They're talking about their sexual orientation. And I think what Paul would say to that person is that does not disqualify you from following Christ. That is not a barrier to living a full Christian life. That's not, that's not something that's going to cut you off from living a full, wonderful, joyous Christian life. And, and I think that, that needs to be said today. A lot of gay Christians who come to embrace the traditional Christian view of sex and marriage have to ask themselves, what does this mean for how I live my life now? Um, and a lot of people have tried to you know, go into therapy regimes to, to change their sexual orientation so that they could perhaps develop enough opposite sex attraction that marriage to a spouse of the opposite sex would be uh, possible. Um, I have some friends who have pursued that and, and some friends who would say, you know, God seems to have done a dramatic work where I am, I am now in a, in a marriage to someone of the opposite sex and it's not perfect uh, by any means, like no marriage is perfect, but it, it is beautiful and it is good and we're thanking God for that. And I don't, I don't want to say that that's not a faithful path at all. I, I'm very grateful for my friends who are, who are pursuing that. I think others of us have pursued a similar path and we've prayed for God to change our sexual orientation. We've explored what might be some of the psychological roots of our sexual orientation. And through all that exploration and prayer, we have experienced no real change in our sexual orientation. And so for us, uh, the question has been, what might fruitful singleness look like? What would faithful, joyful, hospitable celibacy look like? Celibacy just being a kind of traditional word for intentional um, abstinence from sex uh, in obedience to Christ. And that's really been my path, is, is exploring and asking the question, what does it look like to be uh, fully engaged in the life of the church? Not isolated, not lonely, not alienated, fully engaged 
as a single man pursuing sexual purity, chastity, as a, as a celibate person? What, what, what does that mean? And, and it's led me into a lot of thinking about uh, forms of, of intentional community, Christian community, forms of friendship, ways that I can belong in the family of God even while not having a spouse or not having children myself. One of the big problems I see in the church right now is that the, the celibate life, the, the chaste single life, is not very much understood, it's not very much appreciated, and therefore there aren't a lot of um, structures in the church that would help buttress it and support it. And so when I write about loneliness, I, I wrote a big section of my Washington Waiting book about loneliness, um, that's part of what I'm tapping into there. I'm saying that for those of us who are gay, and, and it holds true for those of us who are straight as well, but perhaps those of us who are gay feel it particularly keenly. Um, when we say to our fellow Christians, you know, we, we really want to be single because we think this is what God wants for us. We, we want to obey Christ in this. We often encounter churches that are bewildered and that are not prepared to support us and befriend us and, and help us along in that. And I, I think that often the result is, is a profound loneliness. It's, it's a profound sense that I am misunderstood in the church. I am not really wanted at at church gatherings because they're so oriented toward married people with children. And therefore there's the tendency for the, for the gay person to kind of uh, s slip through the cracks, so to speak, you know, to, 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 be, to be marginalized in the church. And that has been my experience in the past. Uh, that, 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 that is one of the things that I would want to urge the church to rethink. How can we care for gay and lesbian Christians so that loneliness isn't the defining struggle of their lives? So, going back to these questions, is same-sex orientation something to be healed of or changed from? This is my response. I don't know. This is my personal response. I don't know. It, it would seem for some it is possible and for others, not so. And, and I want us to think about this because, you know, we, we may find that previously we've thought about it in one, one or the other. So, so for us who have seen that, yeah, same-sex sexual behaviour is outside of God's ideal, the, the assumption is perhaps is that, oh, well, God will then heal them or change that same-sex attracted person. And so we see it purely from that lens. And so our expectation for gay Christians is that that, that they be healed. We pray for them, they be healed. And I want us to think about it more deeply and, and perhaps looking at it or seeing the parallel with physical healing. Because my conviction is, and I think the Bible's is, is that, that we can receive physical healing a, as Christians, that, that miraculously we can see God heal us. But we know the reality. We know that there's some people who aren't, have received physical healing. We know Christians that have been prayed for and that, that ask for it, and they still haven't received physical healing. Just imagine for a moment someone in a wheelchair and, and that you say to them, well, you know, you just need to be healed. So you don't need any wheelchair ramps. Just be healed and then get up and walk up the steps. That would be a fairly, fairly callous way to engage with them, wouldn't it? And I, th I think we need to see similarities here with gay Christians is that although we could have a conviction that God can change them and God can heal them, however you want to look at it, the reality is some people haven't changed and aren't changed and in fact some are seeking a different journey and that is that their journey is one of engaging in with celibacy and being single. So my view is, is that we need to let people, gay, gay same-sex attracted Christians decide for themselves 
which journey they want to go on. And whichever journey they want to go on, whether that's change, healing, we support them in that. Or if they want to go on a journey of celibacy and singleness, then we support them in that. It's really up to them. Our job is not to tell them which journey they need to go on, but to support them. So that really leads to the next question and what Leslie, uh, Wesley was talking about is, is uh, the journey of celibacy. And so the question is, is there a place in church for those who identify as same-sex attracted? And I would say yes, definitely. Absolutely. Absolutely. As Wesley Hill says, the same-sex attraction does not disqualify you from following Christ. Doesn't disqualify you from same-sex attraction. Doesn't disqualify you. So now I want us to hear again David, a bit more of David Bennett's story. And the church, we're so diverse, we're so different. We don't look like each other you know we have radically different experiences but the holy spirit is the one who holds us together and he did that you know through years in this church that for me and that's where i really fell in love with god and yeah he just transformed my life but the question of my sexuality wasn't answered It was something I kept putting to the side. It's just too painful, too hard, too much. And I just wanted to enjoy God and what I'd received. And I remember the Lord saying to me, just practice my royal law. That's all I want you to do. Love me and love others as I've loved you and as you love yourself. And just do that. So that's what I did for three years. And as I did that, I was transformed. You know, more more transformation was happening in my life. And more revelation was being given to me so I could suddenly start to understand the story of the Bible, the story of God's relationship to humanity, what the gospel meant on deeper levels. And finally, I just got to this point where I knew that male and female, that marriage between a man and woman wasn't about some archaic ethic that was thought upon me to oppress me, but it was about something sacred within God's identity as creator that he set up male and female and marriage and all of this to reflect an even greater reality that I wasn't excluded from. So sure, even if he created us male and female in the beginning, and that's still good and that still has moral importance for how we understand our sexuality now in the doctrine of marriage, there was this future eschatological reality that that marriage pointed to that was greater and more important than than it and I was part of that in Christ so even if I couldn't easily relate to marriage or go and have my gay marriage I could be part of what marriage pointed to which is actually the greater marriage of heaven and earth of Jesus in the church and so suddenly that didn't matter as much because yeah sure I might be excluded from one of God's created goods, but I was part of a much greater good that eclipsed even the most beautiful created good. But it does did require a moment of the cross, a moment of like self-death, where I was willing to give my sexuality to God. And that was actually in Strasbourg, France, where I'd come to do my exchange year in my degree at university. It was the third year into my faith. And I remember saying to God, you know, I want to go and have a boyfriend. I'm in France, like, this is the dream. So, like, you better show up and show me or I'm going to go do that. You, you know, and God said, well, I want to show you what the dream looks like from my angle. I want to give you what my version of the dream is. And so on my, around my birthday, I felt the Holy Spirit prompt me and saying, I'm going to send you a book to kind of answer the question for you. And so this one package came during my birthday, nothing else. It was just a book, Washed and Waiting by Wesley Hill, and I read that. And that was about, you know, the celibate gay Christian who had wrestled with his sexuality and decided, I'm going to give myself to God in celibacy. And he wrote in such a way that didn't make celibacy look like this oppressive thing, but actually this incredibly beautiful path that was Jesus 
Jesus saturated, that Jesus was celibate and that he was the greatest example of human flourishing. And that suddenly I almost felt myself being delivered from the idol of romantic love that so much of the church and so much of secular society had worshipped. And I felt the Holy Spirit as I re was reading that book, I had this encounter with him where he said, I want you to give me your homosexuality. And I just had gotten to this point where I was like, well, anything in my life, if you want my money, if you want, you know, my, if you want to take my life and I leave the earth, like whatever it is, like you can, t you can do it, Lord. Like you have total jurisdiction over me. So yeah, you can have my homosexuality. I think I had to get to that point where I trusted God enough to give him something that sacred and important to me. And so I remember this kind of holy exchange where I just gave him my homosexuality and then he filled my bo body from the top of my head to the tips of my toes with resurrection power. And I could suddenly be celibate. But then of course I ended up in bed with a French man <laughs> three weeks later. And I think it's really important that when God does something, our human weakness isn't just eradicated. Sometimes it's intensified so that God can actually make our weakness his strength, you know, perfect his strength in our weakness. And I think that's something we don't get as Christians enough with this question. We think it's all about being strong. I'm going to go be celibate. That's not Christian celibacy. That is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about this utterly weak. You cannot do it. You give yourself to God and he does it in you. And you often fall, but never fatally, only to show you that it's him in us doing it, bringing forth this fruit of righteousness. And so I had to learn that. I got this, this psalm in my head. Though I make my bed in the depths of the earth, you are still there. Where can I flee from your presence? You know, and that just was this sense of I'm with you even in the dark, difficult, weaker moments. And suddenly I was different. It's as if I couldn't do that anymore. I had actually been internally changed. And so I stopped and I said, I, I can't do this. Like, Jesus is my life and I've given my whole life to Jesus. And many years later, we met up and we talked about that moment. He said, it's the only time I've ever thought Jesus was real. And I've, it's, it's kind of like constantly come up in my mind. And I kind of have this interest in faith now that I would never have had. And I know it's real for you because you couldn't have done that unless it was real. But God brings us through into righteousness that does end up fulfilling the law. I think that's the whole beauty of Jesus, that he fulfilled the law on our behalf. And if you're gay listening to this, he fulfilled the law for you. You don't have to do that. You just have to be the weak <laughs> vessel that gives him what makes it difficult for you to fulfill the law and he will do it in you. And that is actually a radical difference. It's really important to understand that there's bad celibacy and good celibacy, just like there's bad marriage and good marriage. That just because celibacy can fail and just because marriage can fail doesn't mean that it's bad. <laughs> and I think Christian celibacy is very different to what often people associate it with. It looks like Jesus, and I think that's the thing. And actually in the future kingdom of heaven, we are not going to be married we're going to have more like a state that's like celibacy. So in a way you're practicing heaven on earth. You're kind of bringing that future reality now in celibacy alongside marriage, which points towards it. And people say, but I'm gay, I want to be married. But what people don't understand is that marriage is tethered to the creation of male and female and is defined by that. And so desire has to be fulfilled differently when you're gay or same-sex attracted, which makes friendship incredibly important, it actually puts friendship back in the center of the church instead of marriage, and that friendship is also the foundation of a good marriage. <laughs> but friendship being actually our heavenly existence, we're all going to be these incredible friends in heaven, so trying to understand what friendship looks like. But in Isaiah 56, there's this amazing passage, 600 years odd before Jesus comes, do not let the eunuch say, someone who's not married, <laughs> I'm a dried up tree. For to the eunuchs who obey my commands and live according to my Sabbaths, I will give within my walls, my house, a name and a monument 
better than that of sons and daughters, a name that shall not be cut off, an eternal name. In Revelation, it talks about these holy virgins that have never been with anyone. And it says that they will be given a sacred name. And that I believe this name is the name of Jesus, that there is a special intimacy that we are able to have with Jesus because he went through being a eunuch for the sake of the kingdom that's actually better than being married. As amazing as marriage is and as amazing as having kids is and all of this, it pay, there's actually an incredible intimacy that we're given through this vocation. So I'd really say, don't just shrug that off. Don't just think, oh, this is some oppressive, repressive thing. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a special intimacy with Jesus that we're able to have in that particular way that the fall has affected us. One of the things I, I find fascinating about the difference between David and Wesley's story is that they came from two different ends. You know, da David had these very clearly charismatic journey, experiences with God. Uh, Wesley came from an Anglican, very deep theological Clearly, he's just wide that way, deep th wrestling with the scriptures on it. But they ended up in the same place. They ended up with the same conviction. Both came to the conclusion that the traditional view of, of sexuality is, is God's ideal and that their, their journey was going to be a journey of singleness and celibacy. And I, I you know... There's so much in, in what David was just sharing there. Uh, you know, there's this statement that he makes. I was part of a created... I was part of a created good that eclipsed even a most beautiful created good. But it did require a moment of the cross, a moment of self-death where I was willing to give my sexuality to God. You know, and, and when I was just pondering on that, it, it, it occurred to me that that his challenge is the same challenge that we all face in some, in a way. Is that there, there was there was a dream that God had for his life, and to say yes to that, many had to say no to something else. To embrace a life of following Jesus and the vision that God had for him, he had to say no to his sexual orientation, in, in, in engaging in, in, in his sexual orientation, engaging in behaviour. And in some ways, we're all in that situation where there's something that we have to say no to if we're going to say yes to everything that God has for us. That is the call of discipleship and it's no better said than by jesus in matthew chapter 16 where he says to his disciples whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me for whoever wants to save their life will lose it but whoever loses their life for me will find it david and wesley have identified an area of fallenness in their world. It's not God's ideal, but they have it in their life. And, and they've given that up to follow Jesus. But that's not unlike us. We all have fallenness in our life. There's, there's always things that we have to give up, that we have to say no to, to really follow Jesus in a way that he intends for us to follow him. You know, and, and here's the thing. There's going to be no's in our life that are going to be the same, and there's also going to be other no's that are going to be different. So we will have some commonality in our no's, but there will also be no's in, in, that are different in our lives, and we need to understand that. 
you know, what, what's really clear that um, even though David and Wesley has diff- have different expressions of their Christianity, they both, through wrestling with God, have come to a revelation. And their conviction has come out of their revelation. And, and I love this, this promise of God in Isaiah 56, which David shared. And, and I, I'm, I'm blessed by it. And it says, Isaiah 56, 3 to 5, And let not the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus says the Lord, To the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose the things that please me and hold fast my uh, covenant, I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than the sons and daughters. I will give them ever, an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. And that promise to David is also his reward. It's his reward for surrender. You know, we we also need to discover our promise from God for the things that we have to say no to. We need to wrestle with God and, and receive that revelation, receive that promise from him that will be a, a reward for us in our life. We're to the point in, in the church right now where a, a, lot, of, a lot of gay people who, who think about becoming Christians or who already are Christians, who are, who are some way in the church or interested in the church, feel deeply unwelcome by the church. Um, it, it's, it's almost as though... Gay people, uh, gay and lesbian people, are considered the new tax collectors or the lepers in the gospel, the untouchables, those who we want to, you know, keep our kids away from. Almost all of my gay friends could tell you stories, painful stories, about being rejected by their churches. Even the ones who are trying to live up to the Christian vision of things, uh, the, the, the biblical norms of sexual morality, would still tell you about being constantly under suspicion constantly sort of pushed to the margins of the social life of the church. And so I think we're, I think we're in a period where um, the, the church is going to have to re-examine its gospel of grace and say, do we really believe that Jesus came for everybody, uh, regardless of sexual orientation, regardless of moral failure or, or success, regardless of background, Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. The church has got to ask itself whether it really believes that. Same-sex Christians like David and Wesley, challenge all of us to understand more about hospitality and friendship. You know, I I find listening to their stories, it provokes me. It it challenges me, but it also inspires me. Because they have to engage in a level of friendship, for example, intimacy and friendship, that, that probably most of us never really engage with. And so I find it a challenge. I, I think that we need to rethink our engagement with, with gay Christians. We don't have to give up the traditional view to do that. That's what I'm saying. You know, and I, I just wonder what, what God's going to do because as I, I didn't come into this series necessarily thinking that way in terms of, of where that would lead in terms of challenging myself, challenging how I see gay Christians. You know, I, I had a very uh, clear understanding of biblically where I was going and to articulate that, and I thought that was, that was what I was going to do. But I find as I listen to real people's stories, my heart gets sucked in. And I think, God, are you going to do something? I don't know. Maybe he is. I don't know. I don't know what he's going to do. But I feel like that it's the drawing of the Holy Spirit. So... Here's a couple of thoughts I had. Hospitality is more than making someone a coffee. 
being friendly is not the same as friendship. See, anyone that walks through those doors, we can be friendly to, but the challenge is, are we willing to be their friend? It's not the same thing. I was sharing with with Liberty and Susie uh, maybe about a week ago, as I'm engaging in researching all this area, and I come away excited because I feel like God's enlarging me. I feel like he's, I'm seeing a bigger picture. You know, actually I was quite fearful about talking about this area because what do I have to say about gay Christians? You, you know, so, so I was hesitant, you know, not sure how people will react, not sure what to say, what not to say, am I going to get into any trouble? <laughs> You know, am I going to say anything inappropriate? But, but that's not been the case at all. I find, I find God expanding me, the Holy Spirit expanding me, giving me a bigger picture. And I actually feel excited about what, what God's going to do. And, and if, 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 if it's just expanding my understanding of what friendship means, that would be enough. I think at least that. Who knows what else God will do? So I would just really encourage you, look those two guys up on the internet. They, they're both, you see more of their stories. There's lots of stuff I haven't been able to show just for the sake of time. But um, hearing their whole story, it's really challenging, but also very, very inspiring. So I would encourage you to do that. David Bennett and... Um, Wesley Hill and uh, and then we'll see where we go next week. Let me just finish in prayer. Father, I thank you that